they were talking about different things. And it wasn't just what was going on in the prison, it was about their sentences and the sort of illegitimacy of their circumstances, joint enterprise and IPP sentences and you know, just very long sentences, as well as everything that was going on in the prison. Hello, and welcome to Locked Up Living, the podcast which looks at resilience in challenging organisations, such as, but not only, prisons and hospitals for mentally ill prisoners and patients. My name is David Jones, and together with Naomi Murphy, I present your Locked Up Living podcast. It's really great to be able to welcome along today Alison Liebling, who's a British criminologist and academic, and I'm sure probably needs very little introduction to most of our listeners. She's been director of the Prisons Research Centre at the University of Cambridge since 2000, and is professor of criminology and criminal justice since 2006. In 2016, Alison was awarded the Perry Award and in July 2018, she was elected Fellow of the British Academy, the United Kingdom's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. She's written two books, Suicide in Prisons and Prisons and Their Moral Performance, as well as co-authoring three of the texts. And she's currently working on another book as part of a Labour Hume Major Research Fellowship. Welcome along today, Alison. Thank you very much for inviting me. Hello, Alison. The first time I met you was when I was working at uh, Grendon in the early years of this century. And uh, it was, I met you from afar, I have to say, and you were, you just launched, I think, then your uh, quality of uh, prison life survey. I wonder if you could tell us about that Mm -hmm. and how it's been going and whether you see it as a kind of embedded part of... Mm -hmm prison procedure now Hmm. interesting question i guess if it was early this century uh, we probably had just developed it and it arose it was sort of a cumulative series of events but it arose partly out of the study of whitemore my what i call my original study of whitemore where we were trying to find a way of giving a language to um what prison officers were doing at their best to sort of find a way of talking about and assessing, if possible, what staff prisoner relationships were like, to sort of put a bit of shape on the feeling that people have when they go into prisons, that this one feels different to that one. And so that was going on in the background. And then we were invited to uh, carry out a research exercise at Wandsworth at a time, it was in 2001, there was a dispute going on at the time. But, and it turned out to be a kind of methodological argument that, you know, well, what's your evidence? And we were really interested in this question of whether you could capture the feeling of a prison. And so we went into Wandsworth and we, we played some games and we found out that you could. And that's where the survey developed from. And it, you say, is it embedded? It certainly has it's been embedded so the prison service have responded really positively to this work uh, and they wanted it themselves and we've worked really closely with them to develop it but obviously that's all ground to a halt um, since covid and we're not sure well nobody's sure are they what what world we'll be living living in post covid and i think the question of whether or not staff prisoner relationships lie at the heart of the quality of prison life is something that people are slightly struggling with uh, just because there's been a period of quite severe lockdown. So whether MQPL will make the same sense in the new world as it did in the old world, I I very much hope it does, obviously, Um, but I'm still waiting to see whether it's resurrected and if so, in what form or whether we're kind of starting again with a different sort of set of priorities. So I, I'm still developing the work in my own research. But the relationship between what we're doing and, what, and thinking and what the prison service is doing and thinking, I'm not sure we know yet. Great, that's that's really interesting. So you sound quite hope. Well, COVID aside, you sound quite hopeful um, about that. And I'm, so so, what I'm hearing is that you you think it was pretty much embedded and was used regularly 
um, which I suppose means that you would, you or your team would go to prisons. Would you do that in conjunction with the inspectorate or would you link up in any way with the inspectorate? No, the, we, we operated separately and I think we do things differently. I mean, the, the inspectorate, um, at the time, it felt like the inspectorate was certainly always in dialogue with us. And I think they developed their own survey, which has certainly improved their methodology and you know, they, they've done it in a slightly different way. Our, the prison service version of MQPL went to, it's, it's moved around, but it went to the audit and assurance department and it became part of the audit process. So it, that was sort of a bit of a, it was a bit unfortunate in some ways because there's a tension between audit as an activity and what we were, the way we were thinking about the survey and its use. So there's always been a bit of tension between whether or not it can be used mechanically and to measure or whether, as, as we would have said at the beginning, it's really a sort of very exploratory device. It's for thinking with and it's a sort of it's a starting place for asking questions and like being warned about potential legitimacy threats. And so we, we when we use it, we use it with a research question in mind. We do. We did for a long time. We were asked uh, to go to at least three prisons a year to do what I would call an MQPL plus, where the team of us from the prisons research centre would descend on a prison, and as well as the survey, we do lots of sort of observation and interview work, and then we sort of write an essay on the prison and its culture. And we we love doing that as a team. We think we've got good skills at that, um, but it's quite labour intensive, and we only manage three a year. Whereas the audit team were doing, I think at one point they were doing about 60 of these MQPL surveys a year. So I'm not saying the service always used it in as deeply as we would have liked it or thought about it in the way we'd have liked them to think about it. But I, had, I felt pleased that they were, they bought into the significance of terms like respect, relationships, well-being and so on and understood that that was important territory. Yeah, reading your, your work, Alison, reminded me of, because um, I, I, ha I had thoughts about the inspector and, and like David, um, wondering whether, whether a shared process would be helpful because it, I suppose I'm struck by how there are so many similarities with the CQC where hospitals might get a glowing CQC report and then later it's revealed that these hospitals have been harbouring cultures of abuse and neglect of, of patients and I wondered whether inspections that included the kind of work that you've been doing might actually mean that you ended up with a much richer deeper formal process that might actually be really valuable you know valuable in a different way to the current inspections yes um sometimes we bumped into the inspector while we were in a prison and if we did we swapped notes and often we read the prison the same way but sometimes we didn't and we'd have a completely different view of the prison and i think um you asked uh, in one of your questions about you know the difference between i think slick and high moral quality and we, we've certainly come across quite a lot of that, where a prison is good at meeting its performance targets. Uh, its senior management team are very sort of professionalised and sort of what we would call new penology. But there isn't much old penology or welfare going on in the prison. And I think Anne Owers, she actually was uh, the chief inspector for a while, talked about virtual prisons. And we've definitely seen a lot of that where the prison that's kind of on the boards in the admin corridor look really great, but what's going on on the wings is completely different. And, you know, you, you will both know that you know, there's been all sorts of the sort of managerialism, et cetera, has meant that people feel they've got a handle on the quality of life in an institution. But actually that material sometimes keeps them distant from what's going on on the ground floor between staff and prisoners. and. And that's why we sometimes feel, even in a week with a team of us, we sometimes feel like we unearth things that nobody on the senior management team knows. Or worse, they ask us to answer questions for them, like, why are prisoners too frightened to go to work? And you, you sort of feel like, well, isn't that your job to find out answers to those questions? And, and they emerge 
as soon as you're on the wing asking questions. So there is, there is always now this risk that there's a virtual prison and then there's a real prison and people operate as if the virtual one is real and they sort of forget to keep a careful eye on the one that's going on on the wings. Thank you. Alison, Naomi mentioned that you've had a very long and illustrious uh, career, which has been largely focused upon morality in prisons. How did you come to end up not only interested in prisons, but so immersed in, in morality? Yes, I've been having to think about this. It's a deep question. And I think my interest in morality predates my interest in prisons. So um, if I try and think about it, I was always reading, you know, novels like George Eliot and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and there's loads of moral stuff in that. So you sort of, I guess you find what you're interested in by doing it. And I was always very drawn to those sort of how should we live questions. But I also was thinking um, that when I did my master's in criminology at Hull, my thesis was called What Makes a Psychopath? And I was really interested in those days in the, in the individual and in moral development. That was kind of the literature I was reading was about the moral development of the child. Uh, lots of Colby and um, Rutter and uh, others. So, um, so I think my interest in individual moral development was there quite early on and in sort of questions about how human beings function and sort of grow in ways that are good for them. I, I was certainly interested in that stuff. And then also at university I did politics and the course that really got me excited was justice and social ethics. That was all about sort of moral and political philosophy. So that all predates me going into prisons and I don't think I saw the connection particularly but I definitely, what, what drew me into prisons were, I was going to say moral questions, a moral concern. So the, the way the institution responded to suicide attempts, that was the first thing that sort of jumped out at me. I just found it really shocking and concerning that the questions being asked weren't, why did you do it? But do we have to fill in the paperwork? You know, it, it sort of felt like that made me really curious why in this institution where there's distress everywhere are people not sort of reading it they're busy doing something else and so I, I probably always had a bit of an interest in moral concepts and moral uh, experience but then I walk into prisons and find it's actually a really interesting place in which to explore those questions. So I, I don't, I didn't know that that's what I was doing until prisons and their moral performance. So it, it was sort of, it was an accident uh, of our methodology that we happened to go in and try and find out what mattered most and that what mattered most was moral experience. And so obviously that's, that's part of why I've carried on pursuing this line because it sort of, it suits my interests. Yeah. Quick aside, you've just mentioned uh, George Eliot and yeah. you'd written about George Eliot elsewhere. Yeah. Um, tell me about George Eliot, where your interest comes. Yeah, I mean, so much about George Eliot. As somebody, um, Jane uh, Davis, who runs the Reader organisation, who we became friends recently, she described her love of George Eliot as almost like, you know, the, the parent in her pocket, the, the sort of moral authority, um, the, the person who she can turn to when she's full of uncertainty. And there's, and I now know that George Eliot uh, had translated Fauerbach and Spinoza and Strauss and a lot of the sort of post-Christian, if that's the right terminology, uh, moral thinkers. So that in her novels, she's working out complex human and moral dilemmas. And because she's a novelist and not a philosopher, she can, she can take account of the real complexity of 
human life. There's no simple platitudes. And so I just, I find George Eliot, um, a lot of, it's again, this is another accident, but I, now that I'm rereading her, I'm reading books by people who really know her work, there's quite a close fit between what I've been finding in my research life and what she has been arguing. And so what, what I'm currently excited about, and that this is my sort of current project, I guess, is trying to trying to sort of synthesize my own empirical findings over many different projects with what turns out to be very long term philosophical thinking that as it appeared to me in George Eliot or via George Eliot. So there's something about her notion of the world which I really which really appealed to me, but which now I think I've got evidence to support, if that makes sense. Yes, indeed. And returning to prisons, and probably linking up with what you just said, what do you mean by morality and moral climate when applied yeah. to prisons? Yes. So I think what I mean is relational and interpersonal treatment. So what, when we went in and tried to find out by talking to prisoners what mattered most, most of the concepts that they talked about, I mean, we used a special methodology, appreciative inquiry to do this. So, you know, when, when's a good day? When do you feel at your best? What's the, what's the best thing that's ever happened in here? All those best things were when an officer, you know, came to check that I was okay when he knew that I had bad news yesterday or someone just let me go and get a cup of tea at lockup uh, and they would sometimes add a comment like she just wanted to recognize that I'm a person and it felt like that was profound and so we happened to find that what matters most was interpersonal treatment much more than the size of my cell or um, the quality of the food the sort of typical things that people think uh, make a good or a bad prison, they weren't completely irrelevant, but possibly above a certain threshold. What made the difference between a prison that you could survive and a prison that was really difficult to survive was whether or not staff were approachable, responsive, basically whether they noticed that I'm a person. And so that's what we mean and that, that's what we've gradually tried to do is flesh that out, create some dimensions and measure that stuff. But it's really important to note that it's not all about niceness. Some people think, you know, that that morality and interpersonal relationships and staff prisoner relationships mean it's all about being nice. It's not that at all. It's much more nuanced than that. And we use the concept of moral dualism to show that prisoners are as interested in safety and order as they are in respect and humanity, but they, they need it all. But, so it's, it's a very specific kind of moral framework that has security dimensions as well as what we call after Valerie Braithwaite, harmony dimensions. Um, so it's not, it's, not, it's not soft and woolly, it's a quite carefully calibrated framework. So is this, what you mean, I think in one of your chapters you describe that um, a prisoner might appreciate that a metal detector will find a knife intended for someone's back just yeah. as much as yeah. a file intended to break out. Yeah, exactly. So, so one, one of the things that sort of still excites me about this kind of work and the fact that we have been able to measure, if, you know, if we can claim that, this quite complex moral environment is that um, we're sort of in the um, what have I called it uh, the sort of moral we're in a kind of place of moral turmoil where there aren't any simple answers and that it's all about finding the thresholds and the tensions and trying to sort of work out what particular blend of tensions between competing values make a prison work and make it less damaging and that that's that's a really really difficult it's certainly a really difficult thing to bring off in practice 
and it's also quite a difficult thing to measure and understand and theorize from and that's why i'm still doing it because it feels like we're, we're still sort of toying with some of these really important tensions but the, the fundamental tension is between chaos and disorder versus tyranny and brutality and my question is where are the where are the thresholds between a sort of uh, the good and the bad or the survivable and the non-survivable. It's really interesting to hear you talk about this. And I suppose that my experience, and probably Naomi's as well, has been working in units where pretty much the kind of things you're describing, we hope yeah. are kind of all implemented, yeah. but that it's been yeah. like working within a, a cell which is subject yeah. to enormous pressure <laughs> from mm -hmm. all all sides. Yes, totally. And then and then throw in sort of disturbed and fragmented identities. So I think not only is it sort of an interesting question what what kind of moral environment helps us to live, but then if you bring into that environment people with no trust uh, and with sort of hostile attitudes and traumatic histories highly sensitized to some of these differences then you, you really are wading in uh, mud and so what what excites me is seeing officers usually officers but obviously specialists as well get this right and work their way through that and when you see it it feels like gold dust and, and I wanted to describe that, that unlike quite a lot of, say, critical uh, scholars, I am interested in abuses of power, of course, but I'm also interested in what power looks like on the rare occasions when someone gets it right. And that prisoners are very articulate about that. And if you go into prisons, you, you know that you, you see it. And I've wanted to capture that, describe it and understand it on the grounds that the more we can describe and understand it, the more we can make it possible. Mm, thank you. So well, you've touched upon power, um, but also you've become interested in uh, anger. Um, yes. So why is anger such an important thing, uh, do you think? Yeah. yeah, well, partly because prisons are becoming quite angry places. I think, you know, I've been doing this job a long time and and I've had the I suppose the fortunate if that's the right word experience of measuring prisons more than once or you know studying prisons more than once and so a big turning point for me was Whitemore 1 which was Whitemore in the late 1990s where you know we weren't overwhelmed by anger or feelings of illegitimacy among prisoners and we saw a lot of very professional, confident staff practice. So that was a really that was a really nice study. And there were particular reasons for Whitemore being in a relatively good place at that time to do with its recovery from the escapes a few years before. But then I went back 12 years later in a different context altogether. And I didn't realize this at the time. So I've been a bit reluctant to get into anger myself. I think I didn't particularly want to sort of work with it. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, it was one of my blind spots, I think. But Whitemore too, so this was in 2009-10, was full of really angry prisoners. And that was different. They, they were talking about different things. And it wasn't just what was going on in the prison. It was about their sentences and the sort of illegitimacy of their circumstances, joint enterprise and IPP sentences and you know just very long sentences, as well as everything that was going on in the prison. And so, although at the time we described Whitemore too, as I call it, as paralysed by distrust, because that was the overwhelming sort of concept we had in our minds, I also realised that it was full of anger and that that was dangerous and it needed measuring. We needed to understand that. And so it became something that we wanted to work with, or both of those concepts. So in the next study that we did, we tried to find two more high security prisons that would be, we said, above the low trust threshold that we found at Whitemore. 
and we developed two additional dimensions. So one was called political charge, and that's, that's a kind of measure of anger and alienation, as we called it. And the other was a measure of what we called intelligent trust, which is what we'd seen in Whitemore 1, but seemed to have disappeared by the time of Whitemore 2. And so we've been uh, working with those dimensions in two different prisons. And those prisons ended up being almost as different from each other as Whitemore 1 was from Whitemore 2. So it's given us plenty of data and contrasts to think with. I think we're very lucky having someone like you who's got such a long experience and of doing these kind of, I'm not sure if longitudinal yeah. studies is the right way to describe yeah. it, but studies over yeah. periods of time, yeah. enormously valuable that. Yeah. It is. That's some, I read somewhere this, this phrase, repetition with differences, and it felt like that, that's why I've become a bit more confident, I think, as the years have gone, because I feel like I've seen this before. And if I see a prison today, I can very frequently think this reminds me of Whitemore 1 in 1999. And so you, you're constantly thinking with more than one prison. And of course, although they're, they're all different, but there's some sort of essential or generalizable things that you can see. Um, but, but also they change over time and it does feel as if there has been a sort of major shift over time as well. So how do you gauge a sense of anger in prisons? <laughs> well, by developing a dimension, I mean, the, 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 way, the way we work, I think it's, it's quite important to say that I'm by nature a qualitative person. I think I like being as close to the ground as possible. So there's been a very particular way in which we've grown dimensions and that there's probably two things I should say about that. So one is that we always try to use what prisoners or staff are saying and turn that into dimensions so that we're even using their words. And we might use statistical methods to define a dimension to decide, does it hang together? But we very much ground dimensions, what they're called and what's in them in conversations that we've had and observations that we've made. But the other thing that I've done um, is get close to the ground in another way, which is when I was interested in suicides in prison, the breakthrough came when we decided to study distress and test whether distress was related to suicide. And it was. And that meant you can measure distress. There's, there's more of it. It's easier to measure. It, it gives you more data. And that's, in a way, what we've done with political charge, which is my anger dimension, is sort of forget the vivid concepts that policymakers are working with. So radicalization is an obvious one and work instead with something closer to the ground and more general. So the attraction of anger to me is that you're not starting from difference. You know, if you're interested in radicalization, everybody thinks Muslim prisoner, you know, terrorism. If you think about anger, and it is related to violence of different sorts, then you've got everybody in the picture. You know, you're interested in anger before it gets sort of pushed into someone's identity. And it feels like what we're trying to do with anger and political charge is understand the general sort of state of people's experience rather than sort of start further down the road where people have already got lots of assumptions about what's going on, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense because it's it seems as though quite often when people approach, uh, well, using the example, for instance, of uh, groups of radicalised prisoners and there's, the, there's often an assumption that there's something different get that we see them as being different rather than see some of the commonalities for instance about the issue about belonging and being part of a gang or group of some some sorts and we can end up I guess being uh, prejudiced towards an aspect of somebody because of their difference rather than looking at what the similarities are that underpin that and it's that I'm going through the same process so whereas when I started doing research on suicides in prison I wanted to know you know, why does someone feel this way and what's it related to? And now I'm asking, 
it's sort of what's the phenomenology of anger in prison who feels it and to what extent and what are some of the causes does it differ between prisons and it feels like it is getting us a long way and I've, I've had to read a lot about anger it's amazing how much material is emerging in the sort of philosophy field and I found some really helpful studies um, one of them in particular by Amir Srinivasan who talks about the aptness of anger and that was a really important article for me to read because whereas I think anger in prison is treated as a risk factor uh, and as a sort of you know it, it's judged and uh, treated as something that you know anger management courses etc need to be done if you treat it phenomenologically or sociologically then it becomes a source of information you know why, well, why are prisoners angrier in this prison than in that one and some of the anger might be not apt i mean some of it is located in fragmented and difficult personalities but a lot of it isn't just like distress you can see it being created by the institution and you find out a lot and so it sort of feels like it's almost amazing to me now that people haven't been asking the question why are prisoners angry they've been angry for 15 years as far as i can tell why aren't people talking about you know a lot of it is giving us important information and it's actually some of it quite a lot of it is very reasonable and so i'm kind of engaging with it at that level and making sense of it and i'm still saying you don't want angry prisons but it's a very different approach from treating an individual as dangerous because they're angry you know that that misses out all these really important questions and of course we have found that prisons differ so we the the dimension that we've used which is political charge uh, it's got about nine different items and because we were we were particularly interested in that version of anger the items include things like my time in prison has made me angry I feel more like fighting back than giving in in this prison I dislike this prison's treatment of people like me uh, and so the problems we're facing in this prison need action now so what we mean by political charge is sort of um, anger that's turning towards action it's sort of latent with violence or, or the urge to violence and we thought that was an important thing to measure and we found that it differed very significantly it's it's quite high there's a lot of it but that it differs very significantly and that way we can now sort of model what's causing it and try and explain why there's more of it being generated in this prison or on that wing than in this prison you see we've um you've written about difference being political becoming politically charged and i wonder if what really what you're getting at are things like institutional racism perhaps being particularly powerful as a as a dynamic for why people may end up angry and legitimately angry yeah i mean what what we found that um this is work i'm still thinking about and digesting so it's not a sort of this isn't a polished argument but i think what we can see is that something happens to difference above and below a moral cultural threshold so that um, where there's more anger people's identities and this this can happen to staff as well as to prisoners they become sharpened and narrowed so um, officers for example might start asserting their conservative British white identities you know I'm a proud Yorkshireman or something and meanwhile prisoners are saying you know if you don't like me because I'm Muslim I'm going to become more Muslim so we'll go to prayer we'll appoint our own religious leaders we'll challenge your right to search my cell we'll all grow beards to intimidate staff you know, that that happens in an angry prison it doesn't happen in a prison where there's much less and so that so what I could see was a, so it's like a magnifying glass starts to sort of put all the focus on difference and it's a it becomes a vicious circle because the more people feel they're sort of posing a threat the more they assert that aspect of their identity there's quite a lot of literature that talks about that that um walser talks about the difference between thin and thick identities and that what we see in angry prisons is identities becoming thinner Whereas what we see in less angry prisons is identities becoming thicker. 
and that actually what what a lot of what prisoners say is that they they yearn to be their thicker identities they want to be more than you know an angry extremist or you know whatever and so it feels like this is quite this is important territory because it's it's drawing on resources from outside of prison studies but it's help is really helping me to make sense of differences between prisons that, that really matter yeah it sounds like really powerful stuff i mean just the use, use of that word yearning for instance speaks of something you know very deep need doesn't it something really profound going on yes. So that I've got also in my notes here that within every thin self, there's a thick self yearning for elaboration, largeness and freedom. And like lots of researchers, I always find that reading only really helps when you've done the research and that, you know, I've got all this data around in my head and my fieldwork notes. And I spent years in these prisons and now I'm finding my way to the literature that's really sort of resonating with what I've seen and it feels like that um, thick thin identity stuff is really important and it's kind of dangerous not to take it seriously I think. So uh, David have you finished with your question? Yeah yeah yeah. I just wanted to go go back back to one actually in terms of uh, I think you're right about anger being much neglected within the prison system. But I wondered, I mean, to me, a lot of the prison system seems to be characterised by emotional illiteracy. And, you know, we've had interesting conversations with other other guests on um, themes to do with, for instance, love um, and shame and wondered whether you think anger is more neglected or is there something particular about anger that makes it even more difficult to, to get at? Yeah, I mean, the fact that I neglected it myself has given me food for thought. Um, and I would say that prison sociologists, maybe less now, but when I first started doing prisons research, that people weren't talking about distress and suicide. I, I found it just remarkable that all the classics like Sykes's Society of Captives and Clemmer's The Prison Community, they don't mention suicide. You know, tell me that you've worked in a prison for nine months and this topic has never arisen. Um, and what I noticed with anger, I did go looking in the literature, and what I found was a lot of the work on riots uses words like discontent. And, you know, and I, I was looking for the word anger. And the only place I found it was um, in the literature written by ex-convicts or convict criminologists who did talk about it. And I thought, why is it, why is the emotion muted that People are talking about riots. Surely anger's got to be relevant. And it was just the words that were being used were kind of muted words. So I think it's it's probably, it's not just the prison service that I think there's a sort of institutionalized avoidance of emotion terminology. And that that's definitely changing in prisons research. Um, I don't know how much it's changing in prisons. and. And the trouble is, I feel like I've, I have walked into a sort of moral minefield that's ongoing, which is that it's kind of ideological whether you let those words in or sort of police them out. And I think that's because of this mistake that people make, that words like love and justice are somehow soft words and they, you know, they lead in inevitably to permissiveness and mayhem. Whereas words like sort of security and intelligence are kind of hard words and they keep us all safe. And that, that just, there's no evidence for any of that. And that the whole history of prisons and some of the best experiments with prisons tell you, and prisoners say, it's when you combine discipline and safety with something therapeutic that all the best things happen. And that's, that's what I'm still looking for. I wonder whether um, whether there's a fear around anger, though, because if you start getting into anger, you surely start hitting on legitimacy and the le- legitimate anger. And that would actually require quite big changes, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, this apt anger um, concept. Well, I've, I've noticed that outside of prison, anger's having a bit of a field day. Lots of people are writing books about it. and Some people have said we live in an age of anger. Um, there is a lot of feeling about it. And of course it is linked to 
legitimacy. And one of the things I've come across um, through a good friend of mine, Suzanne Carstet, she told me about an experiment. It's a really famous experiment, but I didn't know about it with, um, I don't know how you pronounce it, bonobo monkeys, where um, it is a video and you can find it really easily. And it's an experiment where um, two, these monkeys were in sort of open-ish cages and they were being asked to do something. I can't remember what, but they were being rewarded with a slice of cucumber and they were next to each other. So they were in separate cages and they could see each other. And everything was going really well. They were kind of accepting the cucumber and carrying on doing what they were supposed to do. And then one of them was given a grape and the other one got a piece of cucumber. And you can see it on the video, this little monkey throws his cucumber at the experimenter in an act of absolute rage. And you think this is fundamental. This is absolutely fundamental. That, that this, is, this is another sort of aspect of my research life that's sort of kept drawing me in. But we know phenomenologically when we're being treated unfairly and we react, it's sort of, it's, it's in us. And so, I mean, we can't ignore these things. It's pretty, it is pretty fundamental. And it feels like the, the, the prison service could decide now that it's going to go for situational control, that it's, you know, it's given up the social and it's going to kind of lock down its way out of violence. But we all know that that's not sustainable it's completely illegitimate and there's got to be a better way yeah yeah absolutely um when you when you were talking about measuring anger one of the identifying factors you seem to refer to is i it versus i thou prisons i wondered if you could yeah. say a bit more about this yeah this is um this is my favourite territory at the moment, so I'm I'm currently trying to work all this out. And so one of the things that I've, the language I've used, I've, I'm borrowing from Martin Buber, who's a theologian philosopher, and I'm finding out that one of the reasons why he's neglected as a philosopher is because he's a theologian, which is a pity because his ideas are wonderful. And so he makes this distinction between I-it relations and I would our angry prison was what I would call an I it prison, which means that basically prisoners were experienced objects. Relationships were quite distant and certain, and prisoners felt that there were projections being made about them on the basis of who people thought they were. In our much less angry prison, which I call an I thou prison, it was a completely different story. So prisoners were experiencing subjects, i.e. whole complex people that you had to be curious about to get to know. And in that prison, staff just gave much longer narratives about who prisoners were. And if there was always someone in the room who could answer a question, you know, why is this person in the segregation unit? Oh, well, you know, he was selling cakes. And there was a, a narrative that, that people would contribute to. And so it felt like there was knowledge all, all the way through the prison and curiosity. And what I'm starting to realize now is that um, there was obviously, there was more what I call intelligent trust, but there was also doubt that in this much more professionally confident and close relationship prison, staff didn't jump to conclusions and they consulted with others. And so it was almost as if doubt was part of what made the prison quite professionally um, competent and it, it didn't mean they didn't handle risk they just handled it in a very sort of holistic way and so I really like this language and where it's taking me is uh, and I am excited about this that I've been thinking about the it and the thou I'm now starting to think about the I that you know who is the I and what's what's the relationship between being treated as a thou and becoming an I. And what I've started to see, see in the data, in the prison that had a, it had a pipe, as well as a kind of second progression pipe, but that, that sort of ethos that we saw in the pipe was also elsewhere in the prison. Something was happening to prisoners, and this is, this is all throughout 
their conversations with us, where they felt like when they were treated as a thou, it made it easier for them to become a self. And there are philosophers who write about this. Mm -hmm. So beyond Buber now, and I'm starting to find philosophers who are really clear about the way in which we only become our fuller selves. We, we only become agents who are kind of organized and capable of making commitments and becoming trustworthy if we're treated as a vow. So there's a sort of total dependency between being treated as a thou and becoming an I, it's reciprocal. And that's what I saw happening in the pipe. I, I've been sort of obsessed with it ever since I saw it because I've been trying to make sense of it. And I feel like I've, I've got it now. I haven't finished writing about it yet, but, but that, that's what I'm trying to do because it feels like this, this makes so much sense because what staff are doing in the pipe, but as I say, there were flavors of it elsewhere in the prison, they're actually being an environment for other people, for the prisoners. Mm -hmm. They become the environment. And in that environment, the prisoners will talk you through how they stopped being self-deceiving, gave up violence, you know, safely relearned some other behaviors, learned to communicate, and now they live in a different universe. But that's that might take 10 years. But the staff are doing it just by sort of being and and being present that's how i put it now being present but where presence has built into it being with another when you're present you're present to someone so there's always a you and a someone else and I, i've used some of this language in previous publications but i'm now starting to understand what it really means and to try and sew it all together so my mission is to get this articulated in this book and to show how what I've observed empirically is supported by what lots of philosophers have been saying for very many years, but they don't say it with empirical data. <laughs> so I think we need to pull the two strands together. I was struck by um, you talking about the, where the staff are comfortable with doubt, because I think um, one of the one of the things that's quite striking about prisons is that the more frightened that staff are, the more black and white the thinking is within the system, the more rigid rigidity there is. And I suppose I wondered how much of that comfortable with doubt seems to me to be comfortable with the grey ground and, and how much that might reflect staff feeling safe and therefore being able to tolerate the not knowing at times and being able to be curious, therefore. Yeah, I think a lot of that, and obviously there were characteristics of um, our good prison, if I can call it that, had very experienced, professionally confident staff who were in a part of the country where their salaries were good. So they weren't leaving, they stayed in the prison and loved it. They were very sort of confident. They were a long way from London, and they sort of felt like, you know, their governor ran the prison it sort of almost felt as if at the time we were there the governor was really clear with his staff that i want you all to look after each other it's good if we meet performance targets but basically we're here to keep each other safe and to be interested in each other so his own narrative was slightly independent of some of the sort of worst aspects of new penology so it felt like you, you had a composition and we, we found this in other prisons too. So we've written an article about Warren Hill um, from some work we did there a few years ago where we found something rather similar. The staff were, they were sort of a long way from anywhere. They stayed in the prison. They all knew what they were doing. There was an intentionality. I don't think I might be borrowing a Kirk Turner term about the prison and everyone knew what they were about and they also had a governor who supported that. And staff in those sorts of prisons, staff use the same language that prisoners do. So we've got a member of staff in our good prison saying something like, you know, my wife had cancer and the governor came and sorted it out with me and told me any time I had to go and be with her for treatment. You know, he understood that I'm a human being and that changed everything. That's it. So one of the things I'm trying to argue in this work is that this is this is a book about being human and it's 
it's about me finding out using prisons as a sort of very concentrated setting to work out some things about what it is to be a human being. And that's why this is as important to staff as it is to prisoners. It's important to me. It's something about who we are and how we should live. And so, yeah. I wondered if you wanted to name the prison since it seems a shame for this for this prison that's that's actually doing a really good job not to not not to be named. Everybody knows it's Franklin. Yeah. I, I've, um, Kirk Turner talks about a yellow epiphany when I first showed the results that you know it was it was a yellow, which means it was scoring three and above on all mm -hmm. MQPL dimensions, and in the pipe, you know, it was it was all yellow, and the only places where we found all yellow are Grendon, uh, Warren Hill, um, maybe one other place. Uh, I think actually we did get lots of yellow in D-Wing, at Whitemore as well. So, you know, I'm interested in what is a yellow prison and what's going on in it. And it's, it's something quite subtle and nuanced, but it's a world away from the prisons that aren't yellow. Oh, that's why prisoners are so enthusiastic about it. When we when we asked for three words about this prison at Warren Hill, prisoners said, replicate this prison. Right? And it feels like in these places, prisoners can't talk enough about how human and constructive it feels. And I just feel like we need to be learning from that. It's not so hard to find out this stuff. Absolutely. And you and you're alluding to, although not quite saying outright, but I'm assuming that this com concept of I, it and I, thou also applies to how staff are regarded by the leaders of, of these institutions also. Yes, absolutely. But um, what staff have always said, despite the fact that everyone thinks, you know, their main concern is money and safety and obviously all of those things matter particularly if it gets to a low threshold but st what staff say is I want the governor to know my name and it feels like that's another human requirement that we want to be known and acknowledged and recognized and that the loyalty that governors get back when they are able to communicate in that way authentically to staff is phenomenal. Thank you. In, in your work, Alison, you've of, you're often contrasting the different cultures of one prison against another, for instance, for Sutton and Whitemore against Franklin. What conclusions might you arrive at about anger if you if you take a more systemic view of the whole system? Are some, are some prisons that are more angry than others, those prisons treated more or less favourably than others? Are some prisons less angry? Mm. Or, and do you, are you asking whether some prisons are treated less favourably? Yes, I wondered that. Resources wise. Well, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't have an answer. But I suppose I did wonder about. I mean, it's interesting that you were talking about, for instance, at Franklin, where the salary might be relatively good for, for those staff. Whether that then makes a difference. But is there something about the whole system in terms of where there's pockets of anger? Um, you know why? Why are some prisons so much more angry than than others? Um... Yes, because it's not. I mean, because we've only used this dimension in the high security estate. We haven't used it anywhere else. I mean, I, I did think to myself the other day that it, I'd quite like to see some angry items assimilated into the MQPL survey in general. And I, I, I've also been thinking I'd love to have a couple of PhD students to look at anger in more depth, both in a male prison and in a female prison. So I've, I'm only sort of starting to understand its significance and we probably need to measure it some more. So the fact that we're finding huge differences between prisons of the same type tells us a lot, I think. Whether you'd systematically find differences, say between the cat the estate versus the high security state. I imagine so because of just how, as Ben Crew would say, deeply and tightly people are imprisoned. Um, and I mean, the question you ask about staff makes me think of my, I have a PhD student, um, Deborah Kant, who has been, she's very interested in staff and she has been comparing, it started out being the 
social and occupational cultures of prison officers, comparing officers in Pentonville with officers in Hull. But she's ended up doing something much more uh, interesting in a way, because she found that staff in Hull have a completely different relationship with the place they live in. So when they when she interviewed them, they all wanted to take her into Hull and draw connections between Hull prison and Hull the place. And their, their kind of identities were totally bound up in the place where they lived. And that affected their relationships with prisoners who they saw as dangerous and not dangerous and so on. Whereas in Pentonville, where staff can't survive financially, they're living in caravans in, you know, an hour away. Um, we, we hear this story all over the country. Uh, so there's high turnover. They don't have a sense of identity with the place at all. And their relationship with prisoners as a result is very different because they've sort of got a very different sense of who the new generation are and how dangerous they might be. So there's all sorts of things about staff and their where they live and their own kind of identity relationship and who they are as kind of economic beings. And obviously being in London is a very different thing. Being a prison officer in London is a fundamentally different thing from being a prison officer in Hull or Durham. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I was thinking earlier whilst you were talking about the I thou uh, concept and I was thinking about favoritism which mm -hmm. um, you know, is I presume the thing which made your monkey so I rate yeah. the idea yeah. that the guy next door was yeah. getting a grape rather than the rather unrewarding slice of cucumber. Yeah. Um, but then I thought on and I think you weren't really talking about favouritism. You were talking about a skill, um, if that's the right word, whereby somebody, say the governor in a prison, um, mm. is believed by his team Mm -hmm. uh, including staff and, and the prisoners, I guess, believe by them that he's able to hold them in mind um, That's right. and recognise them. Yeah. And how do you teach that? Yeah, it's a, that's a really important phrase. And I, I, have, I talk a lot with Kirk Turner, who works in the um, Offender Pathway bit of the organisation, and he uses that term, holding in mind. And it feels it's, it's really important, isn't it, that that is connected to the feeling of being treated as a vow, that someone, it's, it's more than recognition and acknowledgement. It's about, it is about mattering and knowing that you matter even when you're not in front of someone, that developing some kind of trust or confidence that when they go away. So the thing that prisoners say about asking staff to do things and they, you know, they forget or you know, they don't do it or they say they'll do it tomorrow and then they're not on shift or whatever. But the difference between that sort of treatment and somebody who does go away, you know they're really busy and they still come back the next day and they've, I've seen governors actually with notepads and they walk around and every, every prisoner who asks them a question, they write something in their notebook and then they hold themselves to account to make sure they've answered all those queries. And that's pretty challenging, but there are ways of doing that. and understanding how important it is and that it has consequences maybe would at least increase people's consciousness about it or motive to operate like that but it is demanding hmm. yeah thank you so since we're talking about uh, governors yeah. what, are you, what are your thoughts on the practice of governor turnover being so yeah. rapid um, and this is i think in contrast to forensic NHS settings, say, where, you know, the people who are leading those uh, yeah. units can stay in post for, for, yeah. for many years. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it depends on whether the governor's good or bad, to simplify things. So, you know, you don't want a governor who's not doing a great job in a position for a long period of time. But ideally, you'd have an organisation full of amazing governors uh, who would stay you know, long enough to create relationships that are enduring with staff and an imprint on the organisation. I mean, I, I speak as someone who's now been the director of the Prisons Research Centre for how many years? Since uh, 21 or something. 
and maybe everyone's tired of me and they wish I'd retire and let somebody else have a go. But for me, I feel like I've got, I've learned the job. You know, I'm just about becoming competent at it after 20 years because I really understand it. And I've kind of grown some of the people who were in it. And I just don't get that there's something about the prison service. I remember thinking this many, many years ago that I like being an academic and a researcher because you get better at your job as time goes on. Whereas what I see in the prison service, especially um, in you know, management positions, you just about become competent at something and then you give it up and you go and start something else. And to me, that's mad. It's just absolutely crazy. And I don't understand the motive. Um, there's a problem of promotion, that there's something very careerist. People join the prison service to make good often. And so they want to kind of go up the career ladder and perhaps you can't blame people for that. But I think it's really damaging for the institutions and that I've definitely seen the best practices in establishments where good, competent governors manage to stay for five years at least and sometimes for a bit longer. Um, and it's devastating for prisons when they lose a good governor, completely devastating. And they're almost never followed by one who's as good. So it, it's really depressing to capture a prison at its best and write about it. And then two years later, it's disintegrated. And all, all that's happened is the governor's changed. So there's, there's definitely a problem there. I think you're so right. I remember governor saying to me, oh, I've been here for two and a half years, so I'll be, I'm looking to leave. And you think actually if the prison service really wants to make prisons good safe places they yeah. would they would find a better way yeah. of managing people to stay in those positions to yeah. give stability quite, quite often that a new one comes in they bring all their entourage of favorite governors from other places the whole, so it's not just the governor that's changing it's the an awful lot of the smt yeah. and then they put in place changes but then they leave before you can see whether those changes were productive or not anyway and then it's the next one taking the rap for yeah. For that all the credit um. and, I, and part of the problem is that because prisons have grown in size and complexity i think prisons wear governors out they've become much harder to manage and to even know because they're too big and so what you see happening is um individual governors being quite skilled but they're almost sort of burned out in two and a half years because the job they have to do is just so enormous and so it feels like it's i, I wouldn't blame governors for this that it's partly the way the organization thinks about performance and it's in, it's impatient for governors for prisons to improve but it's almost impossible for governors to do that in a way that is sort of sending into the prison these sort of really strong foundations and so they concentrate on what they can do and then and sometimes those are superficial things I suppose it also reminds me of um, Fallon's inquiry into Ashworth Hospital and what came out of that. And part of that was the recommendation that there are a lot of experienced staff. So certainly, for instance, when uh, D-Wing, the FEMS unit set up, a lot of consultant staff that people might look at and think, how can you justify so many senior staff? But actually, we never it never felt as though we had too many consultants because the complexity of the work is such that you actually need a lot of a lot of brain power and experience and knowledge to be thinking about and finding creative solutions to problems and I you know the, the task of being a governor can't be any less than that can it you're talking about a very similar population so so really I think in certainly in the high secure estate where you've got people presenting in ways which are really very challenging that in itself perhaps ought to be recognised as being a promotion above, you know, requiring something above being yeah. a governor in a in a, a prison where the stakes are lower. Yeah, there isn't a science of prison management and it feels like there just should be. So even yeah. if you try and talk about who's a good governor, how does anyone know that? And there isn't enough thinking within the organisation about how you assess what contribution is a governor making and everybody kind of knows who's outstanding but it, it's a bit like the whole question of outstanding prisons it all needs to be articulated and that there are, there are things that so i described the governor of franklin as a statesman uh, because, partly based on what staff and prisoners were saying about him that you know he was present he was authentic 
he was passionate, uh, they placed their trust in him. Uh, he wasn't perfect, that it's, it's impossible to be perfect and to get everything right. But there was a general consensus that he was running a well-ordered prison and it, his speeches were intended to deliver that and he was very consistent. So, you know, we could, we could be putting together much more sort of evidence about what the characteristics are of outstanding governors and just I think the organization needs to be a bit more honest with itself about who's good and who isn't and what you do about that and then how you get governors to be good that it feels like it's really important territory and it doesn't feel like there's much attention paid to it no I mean I think making it a profession might help might it I mean at the moment there there are a few consequences there's no other professions you can complain to somebody's regulatory body if if um, they're below par and or do something that's that's frankly wrong but of course that isn't an option um, in the prison service with with governors um, so there are a lot there's a lot that could be done to I think really champion the qualities that would make somebody a really good professional governor as well as the opportunity to then address the ones that are more poorly performing yeah, yeah. and to have some agreements about you know at what point I and mean, this obviously came up very early in um, the Whitemore example, at what point does a governor cease to be responsible for the prison they were governing? And when does the new governor become responsible? So it's a, this is linked to the three year turnover that, you know, there's something slightly uncomfortable about who's accountable for the performance of a prison. If three weeks ago, I took over this ailing prison and I haven't managed to turn it around yet. Well, is that my flaw as a governor? or has it, it just been made impossible for me? So I think it's, it's, again, it needs quite sort of sensible thinking through. Absolutely. You make several references to vibrations of feelings in your recent work, Alison, and I wondered if, like psychotherapy, quantum theory is beginning to permeate criminology. Well, I, hadn't, I, I didn't recognise uh, the relationship between quantum theory and psychotherapy, so I'd be interested to hear more. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not sure I, I'm adept enough to give a to give an overview there. But I, was, I suppose I've, you know, people talk about kind of like feeling and energy being yeah. transferable from. Yeah. I, I've used this term that that human beings vibrate. Uh, again, it's from George Eliot, but it's grounded in other thinkers. And I think what I mean, and I, I'm sort of finding this everywhere now, is that. Um, we are kind of made or unmade by other human beings and that our growth or disintegration is structured by the feedback that we're getting from the people around us. And so it's this sort of, it's a little bit like the I-thou argument, it's a different dimension of it, that we depend on others for our own sanity and that human beings can either destroy us or they can help us to thrive and that this isn't all verbal that some of the stuff that goes on between human beings we're quite sophisticated and we infer things we sense things that that um you, you could think of it as us being sort of quite musical and that we we know what others think of us without spoken language I mean, sometimes we get that wrong, but that is making a difference to how we act and what we become. So we, we live in this sort of world of vibrations and it impacts on us. And I think, you know, when, when we get good vibrations, life goes better. And when we get bad ones, we end up in a pretty bad state. And so it, it feels like it's an important part of, of how we are and how we live. And it makes it, makes it easier I like the language because it makes it easier for prison officers to understand that this thing about them being an environment for someone else and that tone, tone, demeanour, the things we don't do and don't say are as important sometimes as the things that we do say. Thank you. Alison, is there any, anything significant about your methodology that you think has been important in terms of your work and shaping your work? I guess it probably comes back to the question you asked earlier, that I'm not a 
I'm not a sort of science type who believes that human beings can be predicted and kind of captured that I think the world is quite messy and human beings are very complex and that what really matters to me is the phenomenological or ethnography part of what I would call our ethnography led measurement so I like measurement but only if it's really sensibly and well grounded in a way that's really time consuming in real live experience and that social science only makes sense if you start from there and then I think so I, I've been quite surprised by how well our quantitative explorations have turned out and I really think they only turn out because we've spent so long getting as close as possible to, to real experience so I always um, I always have a bad reaction when people talk about scales and they get their scales from a book and they kind of implement it on a prison it just feels like why would you even do that that always start from scratch hang out and work out what it is you're trying to measure and that you, you learn a lot from that and then I think this, the whole social science enterprise takes off and so I call it ethnography led measurement and it, and it feels like it's fusing qualitative with quantitative methods but sort of never gives up on the qualitative it always feels like that's that's the thing that is going to help us to make sense of this world thank you david i feel like i've been hogging the interview do you want to ask the last question um okay um so you've covered some very heavy themes over your career in fact you've been immersed in societies that most people would regard as being extremely heavy and damaging and uh, depressing really mm -hmm. how have you kept yourself emotionally grounded and nourished yes um partly by the appreciative inquiry discovery and and i still do this now when i went to my first prison post covid i was absolutely determined that i was going to go to a good prison i i asked around i thought about it i talked to people and i would only go to somewhere where i thought i'd find the the things that i'm looking for you know good uses of authority people being brought back to life you know i i i deliberately find my way to places where there's hope and humanity if i can and i get very distressed if i can't find it or i think it's disappearing so in in the work context i would always so in a as an example when i was doing a study of high risk suicide uh, prisons we were given 10 prisons that were all terrible to study and i added in two that were really good um not just for therapy but because it's always important to sort of stretch the experience from bad to good to understand it. So that's helped to keep me sane at difficult times in the prisons world. But obviously outside of prisons, um, I, I do make sure I've got really close friends, close friends who I stay very close to. And um, I'm quite, I like, I'm a physical person. I like lots of physical things. So I dance, I walk, I cycle, uh, I do Tai Chi, uh, yoga, I'm, I like to be in the physical world and that is linked to another important aspect of what keeps me sane which is that I love the natural world, that it makes my day if I have a deer in my garden or a pheasant passing through and um, that's really important to me, I can't not be around the natural world um, and yeah I've got passions I suppose. I'm very fond of Pinot Noir as my good friends know and, and I, the thing that I haven't managed to do during this sort of difficult period is um, Australia and New Zealand were always my places of resort. If it all got too difficult I'd go to Australia or New Zealand and of course I haven't managed to do that and probably won't for some time and I have to say I am having a bit of a pine. Um, it brings all my passions together because of the outdoor life and the Pinot Noir and very close friends and lots of other things so i am a bit finely about that but i'm hoping that it will return at some point thank you very much i, I think you said somewhere or wrote somewhere that uh, you'd always found that the best approach to people was to be very pleasant to them and that kind of 
underscored your whole methodology, um, which I thought was really interesting and worthwhile. I have to say I've learnt more from you and my friend Lorna Rhodes about mm -hmm. anthropology than anything else. Uh, so oh, thanks very much for that. Well, thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, that was really nice. Thank you, Alison. It's a real pleasure to meet uh, with Alison Liebling, who comes across and, well, indeed is a very warm and sympathetic person. And uh, cleverly, she's integrated her persona into her style of work. So she manages to engage with people uh, anywhere and at any level. Uh, through the sheer kind of warmth of her personality, it seems to me. And it's a very effective uh, yeah, method. The other thing that struck me was what a tr tremendous mentor uh, she is and has been over, well, over 20 years now since she's been head of the department. There are so many people that we've spoken to who have been inspired by her support absolutely i'm i'm relieved not to be have to having to answer the question of why haven't you had her on yet obviously we've been waiting a very long time for that conversation for for when it suited alison's diary um because obviously she is i mean she is kind of like professor criminology isn't she uh, but yes a really warm humble person um, but I think also what's what was really striking was her the importance, her observation of how important it is to ask questions that just seem blindingly obvious, and yet people steer away from them. You know, why aren't pe why weren't people asking about distress when thinking about suicide and self harm, and why weren't people thinking about anger when thinking about rioting? Um, you know, she really shines a spotlight on the emotional illiteracy of the prison service, really. Something, isn't there, about the enduring relationship as well, that you can see that from Alison's um, long-standing relationship in terms of what she's doing, that you get a real richness of information because she's able to compare and contrast over time and how much prisons suffer from that lack of continuity and lack of consistency um obviously that's not just about prisons but also the um policy makers above as well but there is something about if you want things to change having to have enough familiarity with the system to know what to really know what needs changing many thanks again to all of you who have listened to our locked up living podcast feel free to mention this to your friends and to your colleagues and give us feedback on our webpage lockeduplives.com and our Twitter account Locked Up Living. Many thanks too to Pete and Rach who kindly allowed us to use their music. You have called me Courage and this is available from all the usual outlets. <laughs>